Last week, we finished Paul's letter to the Galatians, and this week, we begin his letter to the Colossians. Unlike the church in Galatia, Paul did not begin the church among the Colossians. Someone else began the church. But like the church in Galatia, someone else has come in among the Colossians with new ideas, proclaiming there is special knowledge necessary for the proper worship of God. Paul says, not so. Christ alone is sufficient. The letter deals with several themes that aid us in our practical attempts to know God and to grow in our relationship with God. Colossians teaches us that we must be rooted and grounded in Christ. Only in that way will we come to the fullness of our relationship with God and our service to him. In the beginning of Paul's letters, he always thanks God for the recipients and shares how he always remembers them in his prayers. Prayer. It's one of those disciplines that help us to better know God and to grow in our relationship with God. We have had a tragic week in our community in our congregation. I know many of you have been praying for the Barber family, for me and Sandy as we ministered to the family and prepared for the funeral, for each other as we have grieved over Adriana's death. Some prayers have been in the form of words, some in the form of hugs, some in the form of a phone call or text. Such a tragedy will bring us to our knees and hopefully bring us together, the body of Christ, holding one another up and the Holy Spirit holding us together. Paul says since the day he first heard about the Colossians and their love in the Spirit, he has not ceased praying for them. Wow, that's a lot of praying. I don't know about you, but I can't say that I never cease praying for you. Sorry. I'm thinking it might be hyperbole. I don't know. But I do pray for you often. Times of tragedy, sickness, death tend to remind us of the importance of praying for one another. But imagine. Imagine the growth we would experience as a congregation if we prayed for one another regularly. I love how our Tuesday morning prayer group has every member's name on a card, and each week they take a card and pray for that person or family. Well, someone has come in to the young church in Colossae and told them, They needed special knowledge for the proper worship of God. Did you notice in Paul's prayer that that they be filled with the knowledge of God's will? The knowledge of God's will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And God wants to make known his will. Indeed, God has made known his will through the life of Jesus Christ. When we fret over life changes, which way to go, what to do, how awesome to know your brothers and sisters in Christ are praying, not that things will happen exactly the way you may want them to happen, but praying that you may know God's will. Sometimes we don't pray for one another because we don't know how to pray or what to say. But we can pray that each other knows the will of God, no matter what is going on in our lives. And we could actually copy Colossians 1, 9 to 14, and pray that for one another, that we know God's will 
that we lead lives worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, that we bear fruit in every good work, that we grow in the knowledge of God. But wait, there's more. Paul also prays that we be made strong with all the strength that comes from his glorious power. Do you think there's any strength in his glorious power? And we can pray that for one another, that we have that strength, that we be prepared to endure everything with patience while joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled us. That's already happened. God has enabled us to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. Friends, this is pretty powerful stuff that we can pray for one another. We, as Christians, are expected to grow in the knowledge of God. Our God, who acts purposely in history to bring people to live lives fully pleasing to him through the life and ministry of Jesus, to grow and conform our lives to Jesus. And through the power of prayer, we can help one another do that. If Paul were alive today, what kind of letter would he write to us, First Moxville? Would he be able to say, we keep getting reports of your steady faith in Christ, our Jesus, and the love you continuously extend to all Christians? The lines of purpose in your lives never grow slack, tightly tied as they are to your future in heaven, keep kept taut by hope. Something to think about, something to act on. We live in the hope that God will bring healing and comfort to our hurt and our sadness. And as that happens, May we not forget the importance of praying for one another as we await our future inheritance. Paul says we do not have to live under the control of darkness. We are God's people who live in and inherit the Son's kingdom. I shared in the funeral Friday Adriana's statement of faith. In it, she shared that she believed her call and the church's call is to be the light in the darkened world. May it be so. Let us pray. Loving God, we who bear Christ's name comprise a unique kind of family. We are not bound together by relationships that get charted on family trees. We cannot be identified by distinguishing family features of personality or physical appearance. We don't live with one another in the closeness that is a family's fondest hope. Yet we are family nonetheless, and for that we offer our grateful praise. We give thanks for the faith that binds us together, for the spiritual heritage that has its roots in the person and work of Jesus Christ. We give thanks for the sharing of a commitment to do your will, for the striving to act in love, that serves as our identifying feature. We give thanks for having a common home in your creation and your eternal realm, for having a sense that all humanity is one family in your eyes. We continue to pray especially for the Barber family, our church family, and our community as we mourn the loss of Adriana.
we know your will. May we live your will as your people in companionship with our brothers and sisters. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.